Welcome back. We are very excited about our program uh, that continues right now with an exciting conversation between Eric Schmidt, the co-founder of Schmidt Futures and former CEO of Google, and Professor Alexander Madry, uh, the co-lead uh, here at the AI Policy Forum. Thank you very much, and we hope that you enjoy this interesting conversation on AI policy. Welcome, everyone. My name is Alexander Madre, and I am an MIT faculty, as well as the colleague of AI Policy Forum. So as we know, AI policy and the underlying question of AI trustworthiness is really a multifaceted subject. We really need to get many perspectives on this problem before we make a progress. And in this context, I have really the pleasure to have a conversation with Eric Schmidt, who is someone who can definitely bring a lot of interesting perspective here and you know, a lot of uh, interesting points. So Eric probably needs no introduction. He has seen it all. Mm -hmm. First, he has been very much there where what we now call as big tech was being formed. He was at the helm of Google and then Alphabet. But after this you know, new like three, decade, three decades in tech, he actually turned his attention outside of tech and you know, at what lies there. So first of all, he was the lead on the very influential National Security Commission on AI report that essentially was trying to come up with strategy for the AI age for the United States. But also he created Schmidt Futures, which is a philanthropic activity that tries to more directly empower the science and scientists who can tackle some of the key challenges we are facing today as well as AI policy. So welcome, Eric. Thank you, Alexander. All I can tell you is that it's such a privilege to work with you and the other MIT faculty. Who knew that MIT would become one of the great hubs, I think, of AI policy thinking? It's been a privilege. Thank you. It's a privilege talking to you. And essentially, in, the, in our fireside today, we would like to touch on some of the points that we actually discussed before. And I know you have very important insights on. So let's get started. So I think it's fair to say that the last three decades brought us a lot in terms of technological de development, right? You know, it, there was internet that really bloomed, smartphones, data science techniques. So we have seen, you know, how these technologies get deployed with many benefits, but also with some of the negative consequences. So from your perspective and in this context, how do you think we are doing with AI? Well, on the one hand, AI is having an enormous impact on biology, science, medicine, society, and so forth. And also it's bringing a number of things of great concern. The positives are hard to overstate. Um, if you take a look at AlphaFold and the discovery of 200 million proteins, uh, it changes science forever. Um, over and over again, um, AI applied to science and physics and in chemistry is allowing us to use approximations to functions that we couldn't calculate, right? That the Navier-Stokes equations were not computable, but they can be approximated using these algorithms. I can go on. You know, in your own work, all of the things that, that AI is influencing. I'm thinking of the discovery of new drugs at MIT, which are now in the drug development pipeline uh, for antibiotics and many other things. And indeed, Dan Huttenlocker, who's your dean, and I and Henry Kissinger wrote a book on all of this. So the future in terms of AI impact, in terms of increasing intelligence and lowering the cost of intelligence and making intelligence more generally accessible and useful, that's a really big deal for society. It's as big as electricity. It's as big as transportation. Basically, making people smarter is a, is a hard thing to argue against. The negatives are also of great concern. And in most of them today, people are focused about the issues around misinformation and manipulation of information, which of course AI is easy to, but there are also other concerns. You and I have spoken, for example, about the potential danger of bioweapons, bioterror, which is defined by AI, or various other forms of cyber threats, all of which are things which we covered in our AI commission and all of which are things that our governments are not ready for. So one of the problems here is that AI shows up, it's invented essentially by people who have a similar background, right? Educated, uh, typically Western, typically in universities. These are enormous things, but as they diffuse through society, the impact of them is enormous. And you know, this is not a new thing in history. Think about 
um, scaring the horses and restriction on cars and all that kind of stuff 100 years ago. Well, we solved that problem by not relying on horses anymore. We got through it, but these were very real issues for society at, at the time, and we'll have the same in AI. Yeah, thank you. I, I agree with many points you, you made here. And just actually touching on it a little bit is saying, okay, yeah, so we have this impressive emerging AI technology. And again, we are all in, in awe of what it can do or it should potentially do. But it's also becoming clear that this kind of safe and responsible deployment of AI is a major challenge. Like it's not something that we definitely are close to figuring out. So the question is, you know, do you see a future in which we can really trust AI, we realize, okay, this technology really changed our society for better. And if so, you know, how do you think we can get there? So if I could criticize some of the, the people who've worked in this area, uh, we've all become obsessed with bias. And bias, which is really important in training data, um, is something that's going to get fixed. We're going to use zero-shot learning, smaller data sets, and so forth. We'll figure out a way to address bias. So I think what happened was all of the academics wrote all sorts of stuff about bias because that's the thing that they could frame. But that's not the real issue. The real issue is that when you start to, in, to manipulate the information space, you manipulate human behavior. So if you think about a, a normal person, right? A normal person is going through the day. There's a set of touchstones in their day, their family, their ideas, their belief system, the physical world around them, their planning and so forth and so on. All of that can be terribly affected negatively or positively, but at the moment negatively by these new algorithms. Um, and you and I have spent a lot of time talking about this because what it's, it sort of, again, goes back to the way tech works. A bunch of people of similar backgrounds build tools that make sense to them without understanding that these tools will be used for other people in other ways. Right. When we invented the internet, and I was part of the group that worked hard to make the internet successful, it didn't occur to us that criminals would, would be on there. Right? It's like a shock. But of course, how naive we were. So we should assume that on the internet, you'll see every aspect of human behavior. It was funny that there's a big article that Amazon has changed its review policies so that you can't submit reviews before the movie is released. The reason is that the bots were ready targeting the movie for some political or other perspective, saying the movie was terrible before anyone had even watched it, right? Now you sit there and you go, does this really matter? Yes, it does, right? Ignoring the fact that the movie got bad reviews falsely, the fact that, that targeted and motivated and weaponized groups can take a commonly good thing and turn it into a commonly bad thing is really a problem. I don't know how I can make it any stronger. You get a, an asymmetric situation where somebody uses the algorithms that tech has invented in, in the inverse way they were supposed to. Recommendations engines were supposed to give you help as opposed to uh, discredit things, right? All of the work we did has been turned by clever people who were trying to achieve a business objective in disinformation. We've got to address that. And the issues around regulation here are very, very significant, and you are quite the expert on it. But I will tell you that we screwed up, we in the industry. We didn't understand that social media is where people would live. We thought that they would use it, but they would live in the real world. Now they live in the, they live in the social media world. And second, we did not understand how easily weaponized social media would be. Now, I made a series of mistakes here, but I, did, I can give you some examples. Um, when the Innocence of Muslims video came out in YouTube, which I, I was CEO at the time, um, it was what happened was a whole bunch of people were killed in various countries because the TV station said that there was a YouTube video that was uh, uh, disgraceful for the Prophet Muhammad. We shut down access to that video. But I should have known at the time, oh my God, people who have an agenda will take something which was stupid or not very important and turn it into a weapon. Right, it's over and over again. That's the pattern, and we've got to figure out a way to solve that problem. Okay, thank you. So you touched on many points. Uh, just to talk, uh, touch on the point about bias you made, I think I agree and disagree with you. Like I think that there is a little bit too much focus on the technical aspects of of bias and the fact, which in hindsight should not be surprising, that these models can extract bias from the data they were trained on. But then I do think that there is still much we can and should do 
to actually figure out you know how to deal with this uh, you know with this picture so i kind of people say that machine learning models are biased i actually don't think this is the right framing i'm just uh, like i think the right framing is that we as a society are biased and machine learning models yeah. actually make it more apparent and that's something where that's where we kind of should uh, you know we should focus our attention and now exactly as you uh, mentioned in this other aspects of you know of of your of your response like there is this whole vista of you know we used to think that ai should be you know just it's something that's the main of you know of technology people people like you and me but we realize that now it really touches on many things society and kind of becomes a societal issue and essentially the kind of the realization here is that you know if we want to make this you know ai has a positive impact on our society this will not be a matter of te technical innovation alone we will need in particular policy solutions to complement that but as you know probably like as someone you know like one of the few people who really spend a lot of time on that doing an effective ai policy turns out to be really tough so do you have, uh, do you have some thoughts on why this is the case and also like, how could we I, go about changing that? i do and um so, so let me start by saying we don't have a good definition of what we want and so if you can't define what you want it's very hard to say how you'd regulate it. So uh, my uh, description of the problem is that, and this is my own personal political view, is that I'm in favor of free speech, including people I don't like, uh, but I'm not in favor of the algorithms boosting their speech with a megaphone. So in other words, my definition of free speech is everyone gets their opinion, but not everyone gets a megaphone. And the problem we have now is that these algorithms are organized around the megaphones, right? And they, what they do technically is they essentially look for uh, adjacencies, right? So Eric and Alex and uh, John and Dan and so forth, who appear to be similar, all looked at this video and therefore we're gonna promote it to them. And they do that to optimize their revenue. So if you think about it, you have the following sort of union. You have the CEO of the company trying to maximize revenue. And, Trust me, I've been a CEO for more than 20 years. CEOs care a lot about revenue. They lose their jobs if they don't get it. And the revenue comes from engagement. Engagement comes from outrage. So the more outrage, the more, and this is the old thing of in the news, you know, the, the, the headline, nothing bad happened in New York today, doesn't get any readers. Whereas the headline, there was a terrible, terrible thing that happened in Boston, that gets everybody reading. So we have to be careful not to turn on the, the sort of human spirits the, oh my God, it's the sort of bad content, um, the, the sort of questionable content. It tends to, it's Gresham's law, it tends to pollute the space. So we got a choice in front of us, which, which I would describe as what does it mean to be human? And to me, being human is reasoned thought, facts, uh, discussion, uh, all of that, which we're not getting. So until we can define what we want, you're not gonna be able to regulate it. Now, many people, including you, have suggested very good suggestions, like we should publish the algorithms, understand how they work, and so forth. Those are all ad ad adaptations to where we are. But until we can say, what does it look like to have a good information space, one that's robust, that we can test again, we can never be sure that these algorithms are producing it. And I would suggest that there are probably some, some algorithms that we can define which say, are these things of general interest? Are these things um, generally seen as positive in a context of the discussion as opposed to shutting down the conversation? So there's a set of, of insights that scientists are coming up with. Like, for example, you'll have a conversation online between men and women. And unfortunately, a man will then say something sexist or horrific, and then that completely shuts down the space, the conversation ends, and that man, or alleged man, because it could be a bot, uh, has essentially destroyed communication, destroyed conversation. That's an example of something to police and try to reduce, right? But until we can make that list, which I've not seen, and I don't think where there's agreement on it, we can't regulate it. That's the first problem. The second problem is, let's assume that we got such a list, which we don't have right now. How are you gonna get the CEOs of the companies who are independent of what they say, driven by revenue, and in um, the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans do agree on anything. 
Now, if you look, the curious thing is, not to go on the side, is the country that's trying to regulate algorithms the most advanced is China, right? <laughs> Which makes no sense at all. So it shows you that you have a technology failure, a regulatory failure, and a political failure, which is producing and it's driving people crazy. Yes, yeah, so I agree that definitely there are many of the challenges that you uh, that you kind of pointed out and definitely like the single mindedness about what needs to be changed would be very helpful. But in some sense, that's the core of the challenge in AI policies. How do you even get a convergence of views on what to do? Because clearly it almost by definition will have to be compromised and kind of, you know, how do we come to this vision of what we have to do, let alone how we execute on this vision. So maybe in this context, you know, the Chinese success in this in in this in, in this you know in this space might be a bit more understandable, but just well the question is how do we get there? And in particular, just to make it a bit more uh, closer to home for you is that well clearly one of the parties in the AI policy discussion is the big thing, the CEOs in particular that you mentioned, right? And currently, kind of the feeling is that most of the conversation with big tech around potential path for AI policies kind of, you know, draws a bit too much maybe around this narrative of like government overreach or like desire to, we should be just like orthodoxly libertarian here. It's just technology will free us, technology will kind of do all good things, just stay out of this way. So the question is, you know, are there ways in which, you know, academia, industry and government and by industry here, I mean, I mean in particular big tech could really work together to guide the future of AI in a more cooperative uh, way, in a way that kind of we don't have this a little bit of a pattern where kind of first we are mm -hmm. very untethered and kind of we do like we just let things, you know, the pieces fall the way they want. And then we realize, oh, things went very bad. So now we need some draconian measures to kind of to roll some of the unwanted things uh, you know, back. So what is your thought? Like, like essentially, like how do we get this dialogue going that kind of involves well, all the parties, which again, will have different objective and kind of helps us shape this vision of the you know, future of AI that we would like to have. So <clears throat> I'm a member of the techno optimist school that was also very libertarian. And I still have those belief systems, but I have a more realistic understanding of the impact that we can have because of the scale of these platforms. And it turns out that large platforms have always been regulated. So you go back to television and radio and advertising and so forth, newspapers in various forms have been regulated and they're regulated in the West and obviously in dictatorships as well. So the need for regulation should not be debated. The question is what is the correct approach to regulation? And my guess is that you and the policy forum could put together a, a relatively small working group, 10 or 20 people, they could build essentially a sense of sensible recommendations. So let's imagine we have a sense of sensible re recommendations. There's a set of, of uh, uh, content that we don't allow. It's obviously illegal. Um, when you have hate speech that shows up that shuts down the conversation, you deprioritize it. I'm just making these up, but you get the idea. There's probably 10 or 15. You could work more with verified identities because a lot of the bots are essentially anonymous. Um, you could also have a rule where you categorize humans versus bots. Um, you could also then publish the algorithms. Again, there's a list of things like that. So now we make our list. Now the companies will reflexively oppose any regulation. Why? Because they're, all, they're always on target. And the way the companies work is everything is a negative. So the way the press works now is that they'll take a single individual, the, and these are companies that have a billion users, a single individual who's been harmed and then the, or an employee or whatever, and they turn that into a big narrative. And the companies are in this sort of constant attack mode from that, and they want less of it. So they want less controversy, they want less regulation for all the obvious reasons. The interesting thing is that the political leadership seems to be very confused on this. Um, I believe, and this is my personal opinion, that the Republicans hate the tech industry enough because of their perception of democratic bias, and the Democrats hate the tech industry so much because of these issues that we're discussing, this is my opinion, that you could probably get an agreement between the two parties for different reasons that would limit certain kinds of speech. Now, when I say speech, I don't mean the right to free speech. I'm talking about the way the algorithm works. Notice that I just made a mistake. I used the word speech when I should have said algorithms. 
So maybe we need a set of marketing phrases as part of your work, which basically says, we're, we're, we're in favor of free speech, we're not in favor of free algorithms or some, some, something stupid like that. You make the point. Yes, so uh, actually uh, that kind of ties into the next topic that I wanted to explore with you briefly, although you, know, you already touched on this in the previous answers as well, is exactly you know, the social media, okay? So in particular, by the way, just coming back to what you just said is that like in some sense you can say that algorithm is a, is a speech, is a free speech of a, a given social, uh, social media platform, right? Like in, in US legislative systems, there is such a notion that it's not only that people have free speech, uh, companies also can have uh, some kind of free speech which makes things delightfully more complicated even mm -hmm. but yes social media this is something this is the example that you come uh, keep coming back uh, to and for good reasons they have enormous impact on society and again like we are almost it feels like we are living in social media so and this raises a number of concerns there is like things like misinformation there is mental health problem there is kind of feeling that this social media is kind of uh, really shaking the, the very fabric of our society. So you already said a little bit about this, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe yeah. expand on this. It's saying, so, so how can we address these important concerns? Like, like, where should we even start when we think about social media in particular? Well, I think the first thing to start with is to acknowledge that there is a problem with these platforms. And the fact of the matter is these platforms went from being essentially linear feeds and things that you search against to recommendation engines. And the recommendation engines got really good. But the decisions that the recommendations engine made were largely driven based on sharing and revenue, which is not necessarily what I care about as a, as a citizen. And many of the companies are lying to themselves internally. They're literally not telling the truth about the, the impact that they have. So it seems to me, and, and I have a lot of experience with, with YouTube, and what YouTube did was it invented a category of legal but not good videos. So the illegal ones are suppressed. The legal but not good are demonetized. And there's a set of techniques which essentially make them, and they're not recommended. So we had a problem, this was a decade ago, with ISIS, where people would watch an ISIS, ISIS refusing, re recruiting video, which was legal but not good. And then they would, their recommendation would say, oh, they like this kind of content. We'll give them another one and another one and another one. And by the end of the night, they're radicalized. Now, that's not right. It, it, it face, it, it, it's not a question of free speech. It's a question of how does the program, the television show, how does the television show for you work, right? How do we feed you? How do we train you? And we fix that. So today, if you look for one of these videos, you can find them if you search for them, but you have to look for it. And that strikes me as the right combination. In TikTok, um, recently, not too much of a problem with um, misinformation, although there's evidence that it's as it becomes successful, they're having this problem now, built a whole engine around toxicity. And what the CEO told me was that when they started, they didn't have such an, an, an entity. And the toxic content, as they defined it, would come in and it would completely shut down the entertainment value of their platform. So they developed an AI algorithm for look for toxicity. So I think the basic rule is if you're starting a social media company, um, and there's always plenty of good startups and good ideas, you better have a model for what toxic content be, is, you better have an algorithm that learns it because it's going to constantly be changing, and you better have a way to not promote it. You may choose to allow it, you may choose to ban it, but the important thing is not to promote it. That allows the voices on your platform. Now, if we don't solve this problem, we're going to lose our democracies. I don't know how I can make it any stronger. My political friends spend their time fighting a dirt fight, boom, boom, street fight, boom, 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 with each of these specialized groups, which are highly funded, very narrowly defined, and become this huge issue. And it prevents governance. It prevents like, is this really important? This is the old problem of anonymity on the net. It used to be that you couldn't tell if people were anonymous, but they couldn't gather. Right, But now, because of the combination of Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and so forth, you get these gathering storms. Um, and under Trump, for example, you get some crazy person, You know, my joke is they were always sort of in a basement in Oregon or somewhere, and they would tweet something out, and then President Trump would tweet it out, which then became it legitimate. And that path is dangerous for democracies. In Europe, if you look, they have uh, the, the rules that, that you know, the, basically the service and 
and algorithm re restrictions, which are trying to address this. It's not clear to me they're going to work. In the UK, they have a bill which describes prohibitions on legal but bad speech, something which wouldn't work in the US. That bill has not passed, but is likely to pass. So we have that experiment. We have the Chinese algorithmic restrictions, which of course are completely vague and an excuse for the police to crack down on people that they don't like. We haven't found the, comp the compromise in, a, in the West, in my view, that allows for the basic principles of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, including ideas that are bad, without the consequent boosting toxicity and so forth. We've got to come up with those algorithms. That's why this conference is so important. And then it's also, once those things are in place, they have to become either an industry standard or a regulated standard. It's the only solution. Great. Uh, yeah, I agree with many points that you made. And you know, this sounds like a good place to start, not an easy place to start, but definitely a good place to start. So just for the last question, I wanted us to zoom out a little bit. And like, if you look currently around the world, you will see that governments are increasingly keen on legislating AI. You know, you know, it is definitely true in Europe, but also in the US and also in China. But somehow this, again, this AI policy as a topic appears to becoming more and more popular, but it focused on this regulatory aspects. And again, for very good reasons, we really need a regulation here. But is that all that the government should be doing here? Like, should be they doing some other things? So in particular, should governments be more directly involved in AI development and deployment, just beyond just like throwing mm -hmm. a bit of funding here and there? What do you think? So I think you and I would agree, and I suspect our audience would agree, that leadership in AI is one of the great national challenges for every country. Of the 197 countries, what countries are going to be big enough, have enough resources, have enough people, have enough ideas to really drive AI? Well, we've already established the West, in particular the United States, um, as well as certain countries like the UK, um, a number of others in Europe and so forth can lead that. And we certainly know China can do it. What about all the other countries? What happens when, the re when our countries, the ones I'm representing in our conversation, are moving forward? What are their factors for production? How do they innovate and so forth? And we don't know that. So I would say that the first issue is every country needs to have an AI plan. And it's not a regulatory plan. It's a how do we win an AI plan using our resources? So my best example here is Europe. So Europe, uh, which loves to regulate ahead of innovation, which is sort of a terrible thing, decided to have an AI commission, an AI initiative to regulate AI. And they wrote a document, which among other things defined a, a AI applied in critical situations has had to be able to describe itself. Well, by the way, AI today, as you know, as a computer scientist, cannot fully describe why it's doing things, right? This is just regulatory errors. But more importantly, they didn't also say, we want to win, we want to fund, we want to have, so a, a good example is Europe has a long history of investments in CERN and ITER and big physics things and big so forth. Where is the investment in intelligence? Where is the investment in driving society forward in, that, in, in Europe? They're just not there. That's a huge mistake and it's gonna hurt them. So the first rule is, it, whenever you say regulation, say regulation and innovation. The problem with the regulators is their job is to regulate, not to innovate at the same time. They only get half the same. Sorry. The second point is the regulation should occur not before the innovation. It should occur as the innovation occurs or after it. And the reason is there's lots and lots of histories of premature uh, innovation regulation, excuse me, el eliminating innovation. My favorite example, Europeans are, it's easy to dump on the Europeans because they start with regulation first here. Um, they developed something called the GDPR, which is general principle around uh, privacy regulation. Everyone loves it. Uh, one of the goals was to have a lot of new companies start that would be proper citizens, properly mandated in Europe. But the cost of GDPR compliance was high enough that in fact, the big companies could afford it but the little companies couldn't and they were much more delayed. So you have to have an attitude which is innovation and regulation at the same time. If you don't have both, you're not gonna lead going forward. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, conversation. And you, know, you touched on many, many points. Some of them we also will explore in the rest of the event in a bit more depth. But I guess, you know, just as a closing wish, I hope that like when we meet for a similar conversation a year from now, 
we'll talk more not only about what is supposed to be be done, but also what is actually being done by them. Because I think I agree definitely with you that it's time to act. It's time to really think of what winning on AI, on AI and with AI will mean, and yeah, hopefully we will all get there. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. And just imagine if your teams can put together a list of the basically obvious things we should do, and we could build a consensus with the work you're doing now, and then we could launch that on the world. I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much.